Hello everyone and welcome to another Global Immuno Talk. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be here today with our Global Immuno speaker today, Dr. Ananda Goldra from UCSD. But before I introduce Ananda to you, uh, I would like to remind everyone that next week's Global Immuno Talk uh, will be by Sophie Ugolini. So I hope that you can all join us next week. I would also like to remind everyone up front that the questions for Global Immuno Talks are via Twitter. And so uh, I will post this slide at the end as well, but just a reminder, uh, there is a tweet at the Global Immuno Talk account uh, that says, ask questions for Dr. Ananda Goldrat here. Uh, you can reply to that tweet uh, during the talk or at the end of the talk or when you watch the talk in YouTube uh, to ask for questions and Ananda will reply with uh, from her uh, personal account, Goldrath Lab. Uh, okay, so uh, without further ado, then I am uh, delighted to introduce to you uh, Dr. Ananda Goldrat, who is a Tata Chancellor Professor in the Molecular Biology section at the Division of Biological Sciences at UCSD and co-director of the program in Immunology at UCSD and La Jolla Institute. So Ananda was born and raised in California, although she has also lived in other states in the West Coast of US. Uh, she received her bachelor degree from the California Polytechnic State University in 1994. And then she moved to perform her doctoral thesis at the University of Washington in Seattle with Dr. Mike Bevan, where I think she started developing in her uh, lifelong love with T cells. Um, then she moved for a postdoc at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Diane Mathis. And in 2004, she joined the faculty as an assistant professor at UCSD. And then she scales through the ranks very quickly. And in 2014, she became professor of the University of California, San Diego. And uh, from 2017 to 2020, she was chair of the molecular biology section at UCSD. And actually, I can attest she was a fantastic chair that uh, helped us get started with all the changes that we had to implement into the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think that we will all agree that Ananda's research work has significantly contributed to the understanding of the transcriptional networks that govern the formation and maintenance of memory T cells, particularly CD8 T cells, and that give us long lived protective immunity. Her laboratory has uncovered mechanistic basis underlying, underlying memory T cell differentiation by driving or suppressing target genes essential for differentiation of T cell subsets, by regulating metabolic pathway usage, or by controlling access to and survival in tissues. As an example, we can highlight Ananda's fundamental discovery that IB2 and IB3 proteins, which are inhibitors of the DNA binding activity of the E protein transcription factors, are essential for a factor CD8 cell survival and the formation of memory cells. Uh, importantly, Ananda's team uh, often uh, use the basic information they uh, uncover on T cell transcription and regulation to beneficially manipulate the immune system to control infections and malignancies. And this can be exemplified by uh, a recent impactful work from Ananda's lab that uh, discovered a unique role for the transcription factor RANS3 in controlling uh, tissue resident memory cells. And then went on to overexpress RANS3 in tumor specific T cells in order to enhance adoptive therapy efficacy in mouse models of melanoma. 
So Ananda, not surprisingly, has published her outstanding work in top tier journals and has received a number of prestigious awards, including uh, becoming a PO scholar and a Leukemia and Lymphoma Society Fellow, and recently has been elected as member of the American Academy of Art and Sciences. On a personal note, I have uh, been lucky to have a, a scientist like Ananda as a colleague over the past years. Our groups share joint lab meetings, journal clubs, and we have grants together. And it has been inspirational seeing her uh, scientific contributions progress from an early stage to the groundbreaking seminal discoveries she reported. And I have learned a lot from Ananda herself as well over these past years. And I think that apart from being brave and courageous as needed to get uh, things done, Ananda has an uncommon drive and a really gifted clarity of mind to find the most straightforward and practical path uh, to solve any problem uh, that, that uh, she could encounter. And I think that this gift has helped her to become the great successful scientist and leader she is. So Ananda, thank you so, so much for accepting to become a global immune speaker and, and for your effort to prepare your talk uh, today. It's lovely to be here, Alina. I, I love what the global immune talks have done. It's uh, wonderful to see them sustained and so many people participating. So thank you. <laughs> and um, as you know, we always like to know more about our uh, global immune speakers, and we do that via questions before the talk. And since I know that you have mentored a large number of undergraduate and graduate students, and also postdoctoral fellows and physica, physician scientists, and I know you take mentorship very seriously, uh, the question we have prepared for you is, what is your mentorship style and how has it changed throughout the years? Wonderful. Yes, mentorship to me is one of the great treats of this job. We get to do science and, and learn something new every day, but even better, when new people come into our lives. One of the downsides to that, of course, is that we get very close to the people in our lab and then they go off out into the world. So there's lots of goodbyes, but there's always new, fresh ideas, um, novel experiences, whether they're scientific or just personal. Um, and so for me, that's one of the true pleasures of this job. And certainly, I've evolved as a mentor you know, over time, but I think the core has really stayed the same, which is really thinking about how that's a synergistic relationship that when our goals are aligned, a mentor's success is completely um, the mentee's success and vice versa, that, that you know, really it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship and um, that core of it then makes it very easy because we're in it together. Um, certainly, early on, if you join a lab, you know, with a, a mentor who's starting their lab, you're going to have a lot of excitement and perhaps a lot of urgency, um, and those go hand in hand, which, you know, over time, I think I've traded for a bit more patience and the ability to look longer term and, you know, think about the questions, you know, uh, even at a greater time scale. So, you know, I think there's benefits to joining labs early and late, and, um, you know, it's really kind of an arc of scientific questions. So mentorship is without a doubt one of the, the best things I get to do in, in the, being a scientist. Beautiful, Ananda. Thank you so much for sharing that uh, with us. It's, it's very helpful. It's very nice to hear your perspective on it, and, and I agree about how being a mentor is a gift, really. And without any delay. So I see you share the screen. So that's perfect. And uh, it's all yours. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Well, it, as I said, it's lovely to be here. And Alina gave a, a really generous introduction um, and also covered some of the ground I was going to uh, do a little historical how we got here, um, which I will do, but I, I will keep it light because as she said, um, you know, there's been an evolution to how we ask questions, and I thought it would, was a little fun to just see where we started and the types of tools we um, used early on. But the questions have, have really remained um, urgent um, and uh, very much uh, with, within a common vein. So um, generally, I'm going to talk about transcriptional programs that promote CD8 T cell memory. 
And um, more specifically, I'm going to talk towards the end about some of our more recent work thinking about a subset of memory T cells, tissue resident memory T cells, and how understanding these transcriptional modules that allow for the formation of memory cells in response to infection can be exploited uh, to understand uh, immune responses to tumors. I will start by saying that everything I do is because of wonderful collaborations uh, that have have really sustained uh, wonderful technologies and techniques within the lab, including uh, uh, collaborations with Matthew Pipkin and Shane Crotty at uh, La Jolla Institute in Scripps, Florida, as well as John Chang and Jean Yeo and Wei Wang at UCSD. Um, and I'll show you some new data in that we're generating in collaboration with Max Kremel and Ken Hugh at UCSF. So this uh, figure from a paper in 2003 was really what I founded the lab on, um, which is this lovely study, really just looking at the ability for T cells to make cytokine um, within hours after re-exposure to antigen. So this is looking at peripheral blood from individuals that had received the smallpox vaccine up to 70 years prior. Um, and really just after a couple of hours, CD8 T cells can, uh, incubated with antigen can begin to make cytokine again. And of course, this is not true of naive T cells, and this is one of the major hallmarks of memory. Um, but really, a memory is a, is a combination, or immunological protection is a combination of traits, including being long-lived and persistent. It's due to increased frequency of antigen-specific cells. We know that, but also their enhanced activity. And furthermore, the ability of these cells to access different locations, in particular, those locations where reinfection might occur. And so then the question becomes, is this all contained within one cell, or are these characteristics really um, the cumulative effect of a, a population of cells with a range of functional activity? And um, that's really been one of the areas we've focused on. And of course, we're, we're, we're today going to focus about on, on CD8 T cells, and in particular, we're interested in the cell type. Um, for practical purposes, they're highly tractable and very well characterized, and so they allow us to really model cell differentiation um, in, a, in a very uh, stepwise controlled manner where we can ask very specific mechanistic questions, but also CD8 T cells we know are responsible for sterilizing immunity in the context of recognizing infected or malignant cells and inducing their apoptosis. And so they play a key component in sterilizing immunity. So yes, as Alina said, um, our lab is really focused on understanding um, how uh, memory T cells are induced and sustained um, over this long period of time and what may go right in individuals that generate this long-lived immunity and what may go wrong in individuals who do not. So we know that many different um, st stimuli early on in, uh, in immune response can influence uh, priming, uh, activation, proliferation, and the acquisition of effector functions that mediate that uh, anti-pathogen activity. And a single naive T cell can give rise to many different fates. Um, so daughter cells that have terminal uh, functional activity where they may have very high anti-pathogen activity, cytokine production and killing, um, but may die very shortly after the immune response, or give rise to uh, terminal effector cells that can, can live a bit longer but cannot proliferate. On the other end of the spectrum, we, we know that there are cells that survive uh, the, the massive proliferation and differentiation phase uh, of early infection and give rise to um, cells with a stem-like capacity, we often call these central memory cells, that really include the ability for long-lived survival, as well as the ability to proliferate and give rise again to secondary or tertiary memory. These cells, however, have lower effector function. And so really it's the spectrum of um, cell fates or states, if you will, that um, together mediate uh, what we think of as immune memory in the, for uh, CD8 T cells. Now today I'm also gonna um, circle back and talk about, a, as I said, a subset of memory cells that's lodged in tissues and for a long time had been overlooked um, in the study of peripheral blood, the lymph node, and spleen and thinking about immune memory, but represents a large portion of the memory response. Now, over time, we're really interested in how at the transcriptional level, um, so all of these different signals can be integrated into an immune response that re-regulates dynamic gene expression and differentiation. 
early on, we were able to think about this from the, the standpoint of transcription factor levels and activity. But this is, of course, um, progressed with our ability to, to measure chromatin modifications and um, identify cis regulatory elements that um, change in accessibility over time. So how we answer these questions has changed significantly. So early on, we were very interested in what are the transcriptional modules that regulate T cell differentiation. And then, um, as I said, I'll follow up in thinking about this particular subset of memory that's lodged in tissues and how they may adapt to unique tissue environments. So we can follow cells on this spectrum of terminal differentiation or those that maintain a more stem-like quality uh, using cell surface markers uh, early on in the response. And so without getting too nitty gritty as far as uh, cell markers, as much as immunologists love to do this, we will um, read out the more terminal differentiation of CD8 T cells with the expression of KLRG1. And um, this is not necessarily functional, but it marks a molecule that's mediating function for these cells, but it marks those cells that are less proliferative and cannot give rise to secondary or tertiary memory. On the other hand, there's a subset of cells, um, which we'll term memory precursors that are IL-7 receptor high and give rise to the more long-lived memory fates and retain the ability to differentiate um, and then proliferate in a secondary response. Now the field has over time identified a significant number of transcription factors that mediate the differentiation uh, of these subsets, if you will. We can see that they're discrete subsets, but really they exist on a spectrum of terminal differentiation to stemness. And um, I'm identifying here that when we started out, none of these uh, transcription factors were known to mediate these processes. And now the field over the last uh, 10, 15 years has identified a, a large number of transcriptional regulators that mediate these uh, cell fate choices. Now, early on, the way we began to approach these questions was simply thinking about changes in gene expression. And we've been very lucky to be part of the Imgen uh, consortium that um, has made uh, standardizing gene expression and uh, various whole genome approaches available to the um, immunological community. And we were lucky to participate in this. And so early on, we characterized the changes in gene expression that occurred early after infection. And then in collaboration with Tal Shea and Aviva Jeeves lab, um, used a, a range of approaches to predict what transcription factors might be mediating the um, gene changes in gene expression that we see. And one of the families of transcription factors and their regulators that, that popped up, which I've circled here, are the e-protein transcription factors and their um, inhibitors, the um, id proteins, and, and as well as zeb proteins. And so this I used as an example of, of the types of approaches we used. E-proteins were very exciting to us because they mediate um, important cell fate choices, including promoting uh, rearrangement of um, antigen receptors in both B and T cells. But they are anti-proliferative. And um, again and again, it's observed that some progression of um, differentiation involves the upregulation of um, id proteins, which inhibit e protein activity and allow cells to then progress to the next stage of development. So we were really excited to think that this uh, transcriptional program might be at play in memory cell differentiation. As well, we, see that we saw a good indication that ZEB proteins, which are, can also, um, in, in their transcriptional repressors that can inhibit e proteins um, targets, as well as um, a range of other targets. So we were interested to see if in fact, this um, transcriptional module could regulate memory cell differentiation, and indeed it could. We saw a very dramatic loss in the ability of T cells to accumulate after infection and form long-lived memory. In particular, though, we saw this complete absence of the terminal effectors. And so it was quite clear that inhibiting E-protein um, transcription factors was important for the, the um, accumulation of these terminal effectors, which mediate a significant portion of antigen clearance. Conversely, Louise de Cruz in my lab, uh, when she was a postdoc, was able to um, knock out uh, E2A and HEB E proteins, the, the two uh, family members that are expressed in T cells, and show that, in fact, E protein activity was essential for those more memory precursors. And so we see this push and pull again and again on identifying transcription factors that can promote the more terminal fates. Um, and pairwise um, promote uh, memory precursor formation. And so we saw a significant impairment of memory precursors. 
Similar to the, e, uh, the ID2 deficient uh, T cells, we saw that the 2 deficiency also led to an inability to form these terminal effector and more terminal fates. And this was interesting to us because, as I said, it's a transcriptional repressor that binds EVOX um, elements and can inhibit E protein DNA binding. It's, it's also a target of TBET, which I showed you was a transcription factor that promotes uh, the more terminal of KLRG1 high cells. So we saw these reoccurring themes um, suggesting that E proteins were driving the more um, memory fates um, and that their inhibition uh, was necessary for the terminal fates. Now, interestingly enough, I, um, both ID2 and ID3, so two different family members, were expressed in CD8 T cells as they progressed through the immune response. And we could see that memory T cells upregulated ID3 in particular. And we were able to show very early on, Cliff Yang, when he was a graduate student in the lab, could show that very early after the immune response, as early as day four, there were cells that maintained ID3 expression. And if we um, isolated those cells and transferred them, that was where all of the memory potential was. And so there's a population of cells that maintained uh, ID3 expression and really marked those cells that would go on to become memory cells. Interestingly enough, they had already upregulated many of the genes here shown in red that are associated with memory precursors and long-lived memory cells. Uh, in accord with that, we could see that cells that lacked ID3, although they could um, do what quite well in the early phase of the immune response, they failed to um, provide long-lived uh, um, survival of those memory cells. Now, interestingly, what um, Kyla Amalusik was able to show is that this terminal differentiation is in fact an active and ongoing process. So we have cells that survive for a significant period of time into the memory phase that express KLRG1, they're high effectors and they don't proliferate. And so what she did here was she generated um, KLRG1 high cells uh, and then induced deletion of ID2. And so it's a rather complicated experiment, but she was able to, within the same mouse using congenic markers, transfer KLRG1 high cells that had a flox ID2 allele um, along with ERCRE um, or a con control cells. These cells were then transferred and um, treated with tamoxifen and we followed them over a month. What we could see is that these KLRG1 high cells in the absence of ID2 converted to the memory precursor or memory phenotype. So they downregulated KLRG1, um, which you can see is maintained in the ID2 wild type cells, and in fact, um, really de-differentiated to uh, memory phenotype cells. You can see the vast majority of the cells at 30 days, although we have equal numbers of cells, they survive quite well. Um, we can see that they uh, convert to an ID2 high, uh, um, to a CD127 memory phenotype. Interesting, these cells that have now converted to become memory, uh, long-lived central memory cells after ID2 deletion upregulate the signature associated with central memory cells and downregulate the effector memory cell signature. Once again, really indicating that there's a reinforcement going on of these cell fate decisions, particularly of the terminal fates, which was uh, um, for us an interesting surprise. So this was just an example of over a period of time, the field and um, our lab um, really starting to get at the transcriptional networks that can promote these more terminal fates um, or more stem like fates. Now, of course, this has um, gotten much more complicated over time and it doesn't integrate all of those other transcription factors that I showed you. Um, certainly, we understand that e-proteins are driving expression of TCF1, which is also a key transcription factor promoting central memory. So at this point, we got very interested in how um, equivalently expressed transcription factors or gradients of transcription factors might mediate these cell fate decisions. So it became a little less satisfying to simply identify um, transcription factors that are up or down regulated. And we took a minute to look and see, and uh, those transcription factors in red were associated with central memory, and those uh, in blue were important for effector um, populations or terminal fates. And what we can see is that while well, some of them, ZEB2, as I showed you, was key for terminal effectors, was differentially expressed between the terminal effector and the memory precursors, many of them were not. So expression alone couldn't explain the differential activity in promoting terminal differentiation or maintaining stem-like fates for memory cells. 
And so Bing Fei Yu, when she was a graduate student in the lab, decided that there must be something else going on. And she decided to characterize not only the gene expression of these different subsets, but also genome accessibility, as well as um, identify promoters and enhancers and active um, uh, expressed genes um, for each of these different subsets generated ex vivo. And in collaboration with uh, Kai Zhang in Wei Wang's lab, then we then use this information to predict what transcription factors might be mediating uh, cell fate decisions and changes in gene expression. So by identifying enhancers and promoters that are uniquely accessible using ChIP-seq and ATAC-seq, we were then able to um, scan for transcription factors motif in the uniquely accessible um, promoters and enhancers, identify tar target genes, and in particular, then link those to changes in gene expression to put those in a transcriptional network, whereby transcription factors that mediated changes in gene expression of numerous um, downstream molecules might be given a higher rank than those um, that uh, regulated fewer. Um, so what this allowed us to do then was to um, predict transcription factors that might be regulating these cell fate choices, and then also give a rank to those, those that were actually um, mediating changes in gene expression. Now the output looks like this. We can identify um, transcription factors that are predicted to mediate uh, terminal effector differentiation, for instance, uh, or memory uh, formation, for instance. And there are two examples here. Uh, uh, YY1 uh, was predicted to regulate uh, terminal effectors, and she found the example of the corticoid receptor to promote um, changes in gene expression that promote memory. And this approach does in fact work very well. Interestingly enough, YY1 and NR3C1 are not differentially expressed. So this approach allows us to identify changes in transcriptional regulation that are mediated by changes in accessibility or um, cofactors or activation um, beyond simply changes in gene expression. So YY1, which had a motif that was enriched in terminal effectors, um, when we knocked this out, it impaired uh, the accumulation of terminal effectors and allowed the accumulation of memory precursors. Vice versa, NR3C1, when we knocked this molecule down, and it had motifs that were enriched in memory precursors, its loss impairs memory accumulation. And so what this really got us to thinking about was context-dependent uh, transcriptional uh, regulation of immune responses and, and thinking a bit more, not just about the transcription factor itself, but what is the epigenetic landscape that allows that transcription factor to bind and mediate changes in gene expression. So this um, was a, a, a good strategy for identifying uh, transcriptional regulators that might be equivalently expressed and allows us, allowed us to identify unique um, enhancers and promoter uh, changes in promoter accessibility that drive memory formation. So once again, this, this little network that's uh, cartoon down here illustrates the idea that TCF7 may have a set of targets within naive T cells that is unique and different from its targets in a differentiating memory cells. So over time, certainly how we be, we've we thought about these problems um, changed, but the questions remain the same. And, one, and I mentioned at the beginning um, that we, as a field, began to appreciate that there were a large number of memory T cells that are not in circulation, and that by sampling spleen and blood, um, we are able to access uh, these uh, terminal effector memory cells, effector memory cells, and central memory cells. Um, but that when you look in tissues, it was shown beautifully by a, a, a number of labs, including Frank Carboni, um, Laura McKay, um, Dave Mazepost, and the Cooper Lab, um, that there was a significant number of memory cells lodged in tissues. And this really represented the majority of memory cells in a, in a range of tissues. Um, there's a characteristic uh, recirculation of effector and central memory cells through these tissues. Um, and certainly in the liver, we see a, a significant portion of memory cells from circulation. Um, however, um, illustrated here by a beautiful study by Dave Masipus lab, the vast majority of memory T cells in many, many different tissues, so upwards of 90% of the memory cells um, that you find in tissue, and this is a large number, um, are actually non-recirculating. And so this is shown using parabiosis studies, and I'll just take a minute to explain this because it's, it's really beautiful work um, that was seminal in, in establishing this point. 
So um, if a previously infected host is, um, circulation is co-joined by a parabiosis with a naive um, individual, very rapidly there's a, a normalization of circulating memory populations. But when you look in the tissues, this is not the case. And so that's illustrated down here in the spleen, looking at the red dots, these are P14 CD8 T cells, which recognize LCMV following LCMV infection. And you can see that the immune parabiont um, very rapidly normalizes um, the memory cells in circulation with the naive parabiont. But when you look in the tissues, this is not the case. So only the immune parabiont has memory cells. And you can see that there are a lot uh, lodged within the tissues and the naive parabiont does not. So there's, these are non-recirculating cells and they can only access tissues at particular discrete times during um, the immune response. But, um, to summarize a whole host of beautiful work, it's clear that these cells lodged in tissues, these tissue resident memory cells provide early sentinel protection at sites of potential reinfection within these tissues. And they can protect not only against pathogen, um, but also tumor growth. They recruit innate and other adaptive immune cells to the site of infection. Um, there's not an, a single marker of these cells. Many express CD103, most express CD69 but each tissue has its own profile. Uh, TGF-beta has been considered to be a key uh, pro-TRM signal in many cases, and we'll circle back to this if I have time. Now, um, when we started these studies, not a lot was known about the transcriptional regulation of these populations. It was understood that KLF2 um, had to be downregulated, um, and thus its target, S1PR1, and this is really turning off the egress pathway for T cells after they enter the tissue, which is important for their lodgement within a, a tissue. CD69 also mediates um, the prevention of aggress for cells. So the upregulation of CD69 can be, uh, contribute to their um, lodging within the tissue. I'll go on to show you that RUNX3, um, as Alina mentioned, um, but also Glimp and Hobbit can promote uh, tissue residency. Now, why do we care about this? certainly represents a very large component of our memory response. Um, however, it, accumulating evidence indicates this particular subset of memory really tracks positively with um, improved therapeutic outcomes in a whole range of infections, as well as in a, a number of malignancies. So the presence of um, memory cells um, within tissues provides significant protection over simply recirculating memory, and thus is a a very uh, attractive target for induction during vaccination, but also a large number of malignancies find that the presence of TIL, so cells within the tumors, CD8 T cells within the tumors that have characteristics of TRM are beneficial in checkpoint blockade responses and an overall um, outcome for um, patients. So how are these TRM populations programmed from the standpoint of um, transcription factors? Can we then borrow this programming to drive uh, cells into um, anti-tumor responses and to infiltrate tumors? And ultimately, how are the cells then adapting to the tissues? Um, because there may be very distinct range of environments in which CD8 T cells need to do their work. And so this is certainly the case, and we can see that uh, tissue resident memory cells may have a number of characteristics that would be attractive to um, program into T cells and adoptive cell therapies, for instance. So we know that um, TRM can function well in hypoxia. They have, are retained within tissues, as I said. They have a high killing capacity and target killing capacity in cytokine production. They're metabolically poised for survival within tissues. So we see an, a number of very attractive qualities that um, would be beneficial to understand how these cells uh, adopt these functional attributes. So when we started thinking about this problem, we of course uh, considered that there would be transcription factors promoting the CD8 lineage, uh, CD8 memory formation um, in general, but that there might be uh, residency signatures that were associated with cells adapting to leaving circulation and taking up residence within any given tissue, for instance. And you can see evidence and looking at gene expression patterns of shared upregulation of genes here, looking at TR, tissue resident memory cells from the gut and the kidney compared to circulating memory cells within the spleen. But then we also considered that there might be tissue specific modules and we can see evidence for this as well, 
where just a subset of genes are upregulated in kidney, but not in gut, um, or in gut, but not in kidney. And that these might represent unique adaptations of T cells to the unique environment in which they take up residence. So this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. I mean, the, the, the microenvironment uh, um, within tumor versus an epithelial barrier such as the intestine or parenchymal tissue, you could imagine very distinct um, accessibility to nutrients, oxygen, you know, on and on. And just to illustrate um, that there would be a unique metabolic profile for each tissue, here's a beautiful study um, from Hui et al. Um, that was published in Cell Metabolism last year. And here it's really looking, um, it's just a, a snapshot um, of the uh, TCA um, throughput. So following the carbon flux using labeling of 15 different nutrient tracers and just looking at their incorporation into these different tissues and clear that brain has a very different signature than lung or spleen. Um, so thinking about then that cells as they enter into these tissues and would take up long-term residence, which we know can be you know, on, on the order of decades in humans, um, they would need to adapt to and accommodate the unique environment of that tissue. So first, I was going to tell you a little bit about our studies, uh, thinking about those common transcriptional programs that might be shared by tissue resident memory cells that take up uh, residence within uh, multiple different kinds of tissues. First, we were quite interested to see how those transcription factors that we had, um, as a field, identified to promote more terminal fates or, and, and more terminal and effector fates versus um, those more stem-like fates might be influencing tissue resident memory cells. And this was really from the standpoint of thinking about these cells maintain a very high effector function. However, they also are very long-lived and um, both Dave Mazepost and Laura McKay were able to show proliferate in C2 and can give rise to secondary uh, memory populations. So they really seem to possess um, characteristics of, of both um, ends of the spectrum, if you will. And if you look at overall gene expression, we can see that um, shown in blue are transcription factors associated with more terminal fates and um, also co-expression with um, transcription factors that are associated with more stem-like fates. Overall, you can see that there's just a very different um, expression pattern um, for tissue resident memory cells in here I'm showing day seven and day 35 from both kidney and spleen compared to uh, circulating effector populations as well as memory populations. And conversely, a unique downregulation of a range of genes as well. Really indicating that tissue resident memory cells were not effector or central memory cells that simply ended up in tissue, but that they had unique characteristics. Certainly, um, we could see that this was functionally the case as well. So um, this is a, will show many of the experiments that I'll, that I'll um, we'll use this overall setup where we can congenically mark our control or experimental cells um, that have a, um, the same specificity. So here we're using P14 CD8 T cells that possess the TCR transgene that mediates a recognition of GP33 peptide derived from LCMV. And then we can mix these together one-to-one -one and follow their um, immune response um, using congenic markers um, ongoing within the same infection or the same tumor. In this case, we're um, mediating changes in gene expression using retroviral vectors encoding shRNAs. And we can follow uh, expression of the um, uh, transduction with amitrine. And so if we focus on those cells that have been transduced and recovered from the spleen versus the gut, we can see that there's a similar frequency of um, TRM um, of transduced cells in the spleen and the gut. Whereas if we knock down CD103, which is important for TRM within the gut, we see a loss specific um, within the IEL. Now, interestingly, TVET, which is a pro uh, terminal effector, uh, functional um, pro uh, cytolytic function, a uh, molecule is actually, it's, its loss leads to an accumulation of TRM within the gut. Interestingly, BLIMP1, which is also um, in circulating populations known to promote terminal fates and effector function, actually is essential for TRM. And uh, without going into, into too much background and details about this, this does illustrate the idea that, that TRM may have unique transcriptional programming. 
We went on to show that there were, in fact, unique uh, differential subsets of TRM within the gut, some with more terminal fates and some with more stem-like fates. But again and again, we see that there are unique functional attributes of these transcription factors that are distinct from their circulating populations. Now, we were interested in when cells acquired the tissue residency signature. And here, Justin Milner, uh, when he was a postdoc in the lab, showed that um, if he highlighted those genes in red, which are associated with acquisition of the tissue resident fate and um, distinct from uh, circulating effector memory or circulating uh, central memory cells, you can see as early as day seven that the vast majority of these genes are already turned on. This was corroborated by single cell RNA-seq data generated in John Chang's lab by Nadia Kurd. And this is the earliest time point of the, the gut trajectory. There's an accumulation of um, 21 time points uh, evaluating spleen and gut TRM um, in response to LCMV. But at that early time point, day four, already um, the cells that are developing in the gut are distinct from those that are differentiating in the spleen, indicating that once those cells hit the tissues, they were in fact then um, uniquely acquiring the TRM signature. This allowed us to think about carrying out screens very early after infection. And um, Justin, uh, along with the help of Clara Toma in collaboration with Bing Fei, then used the PageRank um, approach to um, predict what transcription factors might be mediating tissue resident memory differentiation within the gut and the, the kidney, and then used this to generate a targeted library of shRNA constructs based on Matthew Pipkin and Shane Crotty's um, work that allowed us to um, screen through a large number of transcriptional regulators for functional activity um, in TRM differentiation. So because this is published, I'm not gonna go um, too far into those details, but suffice it to say, we could see that um, T cells that accumulated within the tissues um, were, um, uh, had changes in gene expression that promoted tissue residencies, such as the loss of KLF2 or TBET, as I showed you, both promote TRM formation. On the other hand, those T cells that accumulated within the spleen and were not found within the tissues were those factors that promoted tissue residency. And here we identified RUMPS3 um, as well as RUMP1 um, as pro-tissue uh, resident transcriptional regulators. This was an agreement with data from Laura McKay um, showing that BLIMP and its uh, sister Hobbit were both important for tissue residency. We could see that loss of RUMPS3 significantly impaired uh, the accumulation of uh, tissue resident memory cells within a range of tissues, most profoundly within the gut, um, and that overexpression of RUMPS3 could actually promote and accelerate the differentiation of tissue resident memory cells. And we were quite intrigued by the idea that we could favor the accumulation of T cells and tissues within a particular immune response. Now, induced deletion of RUMPS3 leads to the loss of established tissue resident memory populations, which we think is a, an interesting um, approach to depleting or um, uh, regulating unwanted responses within tissue for another day. Now, how is it that RUMPS is regulating tissue resident memory formation and uh, survival? What we can see, um, and this is data from Matthew Pipkin's lab, is that when he overexpressed RUMPS3, we can see that a large portion of what we term the core tissue residency signature was upregulated. So Bing Fei and Justin collected all of the different gene expression data sets that were available and compared uh, expression of tissue resonant populations to their circulating counterparts and identified a common set of genes that were upregulated um, by tissue resonant memory cells or downregulated. And these are those um, genes that are represented in the circulating populations. So overexpression of RUNX3 led to uh, um, an upregulation of much of that core signature. And loss of RUNX3 depleted the expression of, of many of those genes and importantly led to the upregulation of the circulating signature. So it appears that RUNX is rather high in the transcriptional pathway for driving tissue residency. This is interesting because RUNX3 is uh, essential for cell fate choices that drive um, uh, just simply CD8 lineage. And so what this once again really 
it, it is important to think about is that this is a um, context dependent activity of RUNX3. So certainly RUNX3 has uh, many targets that are essential for CD8 function um, that are um, actively um, being transcribed within uh, T cells in circulation, but that there's a unique set of um, transcriptional targets within TRM that is important for their differentiation and survival. So at this point, we thought, okay, we're starting to get a handle on what genes have to be turned on for general residency. Can we use this to then drive cells into tissues, for instance, in the case of tumors? Because after all, tumors are tissues too, um, which I think sometimes as immunologists we forget. Um, and Justin noticed that a large um, number of uh, genes contained within that TRM core gene signature, here shown in purple, were upregulated in many of the TIL gene expression data sets that he had looked at, and that the circulating core genes were downregulated. And we can see in a PCA plot that certainly tissue resident memory cells and TIL are distinct, but that they're um, more similar than the circulating effector populations, their circulating counterparts. In a whole range of um, human data sets, uh, Bing Fei and Justin could see that the TRM core signature was uh, upregulated in the TIL versus PBMC populations. And as I said earlier, there was a growing number of examples where um, the presence of TRM like TIL was an indicator of positive outcome in a range of malignancies. Single cell data perhaps shows this even more clearly. If um, we're now looking at tissue resident memory cells from uh, all of these different tissues compared to their circulating counterparts, or T cells recovered from tumor compared to their circulating counterparts. And you can see here, if we look at um, expression of that core residency signature, this is uh, expressed quite high in uh, T cells that are recovered from tumors, as well as those um, T cells that were uh, bona fide. Uh, antigen specific memory cells. So t, t cells, when they enter into the, the and accumulate within the tumor, upregulate the TRM signature. Or those cells that do upregulate the TRM signature are able to stay there and survive. Um, and, and, the, and I'll show you data to support that idea. Okay, so what Justin could see is that yes, indeed, RUNCS3 and BLIMP do drive this residency signature and um, characteristics by anti-tumor T cells. So if he knocked down uh, RUNCS3 with an SHRNA, these cells were unable to accumulate in the tumor, um, and even though they survived just fine in the spleen. And if cells overexpressed RUNCS3, they accumulated in tumors um, eight to tenfold more till accumulated in those tumors. And this was um, largely due to upregulation of that core signature. Similarly, loss of LIMP1 led to an impairment not only of TRM, but also of till accumulation within tumors. This uh, enhanced uh, TR, uh, TIL accumulation due to RUNX3 overexpression led to smaller tumors and increased survival. And perhaps most dramatically, you can see in a histology um, view that many more of these T cells accumulate in the core of the tumors and um, can penetrate further into these tumors. Um, not then only an increase in number, but increased accessibility um, throughout the tumor. Um, and you can see this quantitative here. In collaborative um, reanalysis of data um, from Max Kremel's lab that Ken Hugh has generated, this beautiful technique called ZipSeq. And what this does is it uses patterned elimination um, of photocaged oligonucleotides that um, are um, labeled, uh, antibodies that are labeled with photocaged uh, oligonucleotides allow for marking of um, T cells, for instance, that are in the outer portion of the tumor versus those that are in the core of the tumor. So um, uh, these ZIP-seq techniques allows for uncaging of um, unique oligos based on the location within the tumor. And then the, the tissue is disassociated and single cell RNA-seq is um, completed. And then it is possible to mark those cells that are in the exterior versus the interior of the tumor or those that did not get labeled. And when Miguel um, can reanalyze this data focusing on the tissue residency signature, you can see um, that the tissue, um, the TRM signature is enriched in those cells that are in the interior of the tumor versus the exterior. And that those cells that get into and stay and survive within the core of the tumor have downregulated that core uh, circulating signature, indicating that cells that acquire and adapt to um, life within tissue uh, do better um, survival and accumulate within the tumor and provide greater anti 
um, tumor activity. Consistent with this, Colette Lujan, when she was a um, fellow in the lab, was able to overexpress RUNX3 in a, in a CAR T cell model and show enhanced accumulation of CAR T cells within solid tumors, and that this was RUNX3 dependent as in um, loss of RUNX3 activity that impaired the ability of those cells to accumulate. So RUNX3 is required to establish and maintain TRM in tissues in a variety of contexts, and that if we can borrow this gene expression module, we can drive cells into tumors and allow for enhanced anti-tumor responses. Now, I wanted to um, briefly tell you, um, very quickly tell you about a, a story that um, intersected with this. And so this had to do with thinking about what are the transcriptional responses to unique environments and what we could see is that um, what, we, what we were curious about is how T cells, when they enter into tissues with different microenvironments, may respond at the transcriptional level. And one in particular was um, that we were interested in is a range of oxygen availability, because many tumors um, are known to be hypoxic, and you can see that here marked um, in histology in the purple, but also many inflamed sites are also uh, hypoxic. And so those T cells, such as CD8 T cells, that need to perform their functional activity within tissues, we were curious how the hypoxic response may influence their gene expression and differentiation. And so, as everyone knows, the transcriptional response to hypoxia is regulated in all metasomans by the hypoxia inducible factors or HIF transcription factors that are um, in the presence of oxygen hydroxylated by PhD proteins, which then targets them for destruction by the E3 ubiquitin ligase VHL. In the absence of oxygen, HIF is stabilized and canonical HIF targets, including the, like, the glycolysis pathway are turned on, as well as um, tissue specific uh, targets such as angiogenesis and erythropoiesis. So we um, manipulated the HIP pathway by knocking out VHL, which led, leads to stabilization of HIP in activated T cells. Now we had shown some time ago that loss of VHL led to um, an enhanced functional activity in the case of clone 13, so a resistance to exhaustion signals. And Ilka Lakanen, when he joined the lab as a Hemong fellow, was interested in understanding this in the context of anti-tumor responses. What you can see in red here is that on um, VHL deficient T cells, so T cells that have enhanced HIF activity show significantly improved um, anti-tumor responses that lead to greater survival. We can see that these T cells accumulate in greater numbers within the tumors and that they are increased in number in both hypoxic zones um, as well as non-hypoxic zones. Now, interestingly enough, Ilka could see that those VHL deficient T cells had enhanced cytolytic activity directly ex vivo. So he mixed together wild type and knockout T cells, um, transferred them into hosts, allowed them to infiltrate into tumors, and then recovered them. And directly ex vivo, there's enhanced functional activity by killing, as well as granzyme and cytokine production by these VHL deficient T cells. So enhanced HIP promotes uh, till accumulation and effector function. Interestingly enough, what he noticed, and this is where the two stories really um, converge, is that he noticed that there was an accumulation of TRM-like TIL. So TRM, that, uh, TIL that had high levels of expression of CD103 were dramatically increased um, among the VHL deficient uh, T cells. And when Ilka then sorted out those CD103 high versus CD103 low T cells from the tumors, he found that all of that enhanced activity um, that was mediated by uh, higher levels of HIF activity was contained within that TRM phenotype TIL population. When he blocked CD103, he could find that all of that enhanced anti-tumor activity was lost if CD103 was blocked. So it's, it's very difficult to fundamentally prove that the acquisition of TRM phenotype by these VHL deficient T cells is in fact what's driving this enhanced functional activity, but all um, data support the idea that the acquisition of this TRM phenotype by TIL with enhanced HIF activity um, is due to this acquisition of a TRM-like phenotype. This uh, showed enhanced activity in CAR T cells um, and also here showing a pr pretty strong visual um, as far as, <coughs> excuse me, um, VHL deficient T cells and um, inhibiting the growth in a um, IV uh, metastasis model of V16 as well. Okay, 
So I'm going to just very briefly give you a little taste of um, some new data that we're very excited about in the couple of minutes that I have left. And so at the beginning, I, uh, I emphasized the idea that we, we predicted there, we we're curious about if there might be tissue specific changes in gene expression that would allow cells to adapt to one tissue over another. And in um, work by Ty Crowell and Max Haig, um, they decided to um, really do a, a cross tissue analysis of tissue resident memory populations so we could ask this question um, in a very clean manner. And so using a um, monoclonal specificity of cells responding to an infection in all of these different, the same infection in all of these different tissues, they um, tie generated RNA-seq, attack-seq, and single cell RNA-seq data. And really this is based um, on, on beautiful work in macrophages um, where it's clear that there are tissue-specific transcriptional changes that allow for macrophages to really take up residency and become part of a tissue. And um, we, we really kind of like the idea that all of the immune cells that enter into an infiltrated tissue may need to make similar adaptations. Certainly, um, Ty could see looking at bulk RNA-seq data that um, the tissue resident populations were distinct from those in circulation as we had seen before. Um, and that each tissue had a distinct signature and we could identify um, changes in gene expression that were common among T cells in, in, in each set of tissues. To emphasize um, changes in metabolism, this is a curated metabolic pathway analysis generated um, by the Galerina campus, a postdoc in the lab. And here, this really illustrates the idea that, for instance, TRM recovered from the gut show a very distinct profile in the genes that mediate um, changes in metabolic strategies um, compared to the, uh, the other TRM populations as well as circulation. And so we think this will be a really interesting angle to pursue in the future. Single cell RNA-seq reveal very similar changes um, in gene expression where TRM um, are more related but are distinct among each tissue. Certainly there are subsets um, or po predicted populations in these single cell data sets and I apologize for this just enormous slide, but it illustrates that each uh, changes in, ex in expression of individual genes across these single cell RNA data sets allows us to identify, for instance, molecules that are expressed within a given tissue, but not others, as well as a um, subset heterogeneity within a particular tissue here, looking at TCF7, for instance, which is expressed in a subset of TRM in the liver and the fat, um, but much less so in other tissues. So we get a very clear picture of heterogeneity among TRM populations across tissues, but also within tissues, emphasizing the idea that TRM are not a single population. We can see that there are unique uh, functional attributes such as expression of granzyme A and B, a much higher in some tissues versus others, as similarly changes in cytokine production that are specific to a given tissue. Now we could, as I told you before, it's been appreciated that TGF-beta was important for TRM formation in a range of tissues. However, um, but Ty, working with Amir Ferry, who's a graduate student in the lab, could see that there was a much stronger TGF-beta signature score within the IEL and the salivary gland compared to other tissues. Now, interestingly, when they induced deletion of the TGF-beta receptor by established TRM populations, they could see that the TRM within the gut and the salivary gland were indeed dependent upon TGF-beta receptor signaling for their survival, but this was not the case for other tissues, really emphasizing that there were unique changes in dependence on um, cytokine signals for survival based on adaptation to a particular tissue. Using attack seq data, and, um, it's possible to see that there's, a, of course, a whole host of um, differentially accessible regions that are dependent on the tissue in which cells were recovered that, that are accompany changes in gene expression. Once again, um, would they use the page rank approach to identify transcription factors that might be mediating changes in expression? And they found that the transcription factor HIC1, which is a transcriptional repressor of the BCL6 and PLZF family, was um, significantly predict predicted to be um, driving TRM differentiation in the gut compared to other TRM populations. And so this was a, um, a possible candidate of a pro-TRM uh, within the gut differentiation, um, uh, pro-differentiation. And this was exciting to us because uh, the, the ZAF lab um, had shown that um, 
overall deletion of HIC1 in T cells did lead to a decrease in accumulation of um, cells within the gut and that this was retinoic acid responsive. Interestingly, HIC1 was uniquely upregulated among ILCs, macrophages, and uh, TRM from the gut compared to other tissues and um, upregulated pretty dramatically um, in gut and across all of our different data sets as well as the time course. So just in the last two slides, I'll show you that um, when Ty knocked and, and Max knocked down HIC1, we could see that the cells get to the gut just fine, but by late memory time points, there's a significant impairment of TRM accumulation within the gut. And interestingly, overexpression of HIC1 led to an increased accumulation of TRM within the gut and ultimately an impairment of TRM in other tissues, indicating that adaptation to one tissue microenvironment may um, impair T cells' ability to accumulate and survive within a different tissue. We can see that this um, tissue residency signature was upregulated in human T cells recovered from the intestine as well as rectum tissue, and that HIC1 in particular was also accompanied um, upregulation of T cells that infiltrated into the um, intestinal tissues, indicating that perhaps this might be shared with, with human um, uh, transcriptional programming of TRM as well. So in that last little vignette, I, I hope um, that I, there's a bit of a teaser for the idea that we can identify transcription-specific modules that will drive tissue residency, um, uh, allowing for better adaptations in some tissues than others. So this is the beautiful group of people that do all of this work, um, who I'm greatly indebted to, who make every day so exciting and uh, a, a pleasure. I've mentioned everyone as I went along and um, acknowledged my collaborators along the way. So thank you for indulging my time and um, to look forward to answering any questions on Twitter. Thank you so much, Ananda. What a beautiful talk and always very impressive and also again, inspirational to see all the work that you have done. And thank you for sharing all your unpublished data as well in this forum. So I will quickly share the screen here. Let's see, uh, to uh, show again this slide on how to ask questions in Twitter for Ananda. You have to search for the account Global Immunotalks, find a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Ananda Goldra here, reply to that tweet with your questions and the hashtag Global Immuno and Ananda will answer the questions with her personal uh, a, a lab account. So Ananda, thank you so much again for thank the wonderful much. talk and uh, I hope everyone can join us again next week and that you have enjoyed the rest of the week. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.